I remind you, when we talk about a forward, I'm going to talk about forwards and futures. Um, when we talk about a forward uh, contract, um, we have, throughout this course, been imagining these forwards as relationships between a bank and a firm that we can uh, spell out as a swap of IOUs today that locks in an interest rate for the future. So this is review, okay, that we could have a, uh, uh, let me just make sure that I get this right here. Um, we could have a swap of IOUs so that we have a six month loan, a three month deposit, okay, a three month deposit and a six month loan, okay? This is basically, at the moment that we do this swap of IOUs, no money has to change hands at all, okay? So there isn't really a loan going on here. These are notional amounts, okay? What we're locking in here is a three month loan three months from now, okay? That's the forward contract and the notation we used for that for the interest rate on that loan was F36, okay? So that it's a, f it's a forward, it's a, you're locking in a three month interest rate three months ahead by doing this swap of IOUs, okay? And that F is defined by the uh, forward interest parity, right? That it is one plus R03, okay? One plus F36, equals 1 plus R, 0, 6, okay? Um, where, just to remind you the notation again, this is the interest rate on a loan today, okay, that lasts three periods from 0 to 3. This is a, the interest rate on a loan today that lasts six periods, okay, and then this is this forward rate that we're talking about here. So the forward rate is the rate that if you could lock it in, it would make the long-term interest rate equal to the rolling over of two short-term interest rates. That's another way of putting it. Okay, this is just review and reminder so that we firm in our minds what we're talking about when we talk about a forward contract. Now, the bank, when the bank makes this agreement, uh, the bank is, is agreeing basically to lend to this firm at this rate three months from now. So the, fir the bank now has a problem, okay, which is uh, where am I going to get the money? Okay. Um, and it could possibly uh, hedge this okay, by finding somebody else who wants exactly the opposite. Okay. So it might be another bank or it might be another firm if there's a firm B okay, that wants just the opposite, okay, so we have a three month deposit here and a six month loan here, okay, and we have a three month deposit here and a six month loan here, okay. So firm B is looking to lock in um, an interest rate for a deposit that they're going to make three months from now, okay? We could, structure, we could structure all of these things as parallel loans like this. Um, in practice, they're forward, they're forward contracts and they're not on balance sheet like this. They're just listed as a forward deposit here um, or a forward loan here. And the point is that, uh, which I'm showing you here, is that these are uh, offsetting from the point of view of the bank. Okay, so, so now, now we have the first idea of advanced clearing. What has the bank done? It's done business with firm A and firm B that has locked in for both of them okay, an interest rate three months from now, and it's basically cleared the whole thing already. It's cleared the whole thing already, okay. This is just going to be, come three months from now, 
we know what's going to happen, okay? We know that this, that this agent is going to be a deficit agent, they're going to borrow, this agent is going to be a surplus agent, and we've already agreed that this is all going to flow like that, okay? So it's all in advance. It's all in advance. There's no way this is ever going to show up as a settlement problem three months from now. It's settled now, in advance, okay? So firms that are a little worried about this settlement constraint, the survival constraint, one way to evade the survival constraint is to take care of it ahead of time, okay? And that's, that's what they're kind of doing there, in, the, in here. Like before, before we get there, you know, maybe you're going to change your mind, I would like to lock that in. Thank you very much, okay? And so, and so that's what that's about. So far so good? And you can see this is matched book, right? This bank is matched book. You know, they, they, they don't, they, they're just taking money and they're funneling it through. You know, they don't face any liquidity problems with this, um, ex except if, if their counterparties don't pay or something like, like this. But the whole idea is that this is, that this is matched book. And so because it's matched book, um, you know, they're going to have a bid ask spread, okay, and they're going to make money there, but you wouldn't expect this necessarily to be pushing around prices very much in the money market. if there were real people on the other side. Now, so now we come to the next stage, okay, which is there's no reason at all, okay, to expect that there's going to be equal number of fundamental people on both sides here, you know, so that you're going to be able to have matched book, okay. Everything we know about the economics of the dealer function says, well, well, when there's an inequality there, you know, whereas there's more of these people than these people, okay, then that's not the end of the story, okay? It's going to push prices around until a dealer will be willing to hold the opposite side of that, okay? To take that price risk onto their own balance sheet, okay? Banks do that. Banks act as dealers, okay? But also private speculators act as dealers, and banks use those private speculators in order to square up their own book, you know? So that if they wind up having too, mi too much mismatch, Okay, they say to themselves, I still want to do business for my clients, okay, but I really can't take on any more risk. What am I going to do? Okay, I can hedge. Well, first of all, of course, I, I find other banks to deal with on the forward rate agreements and all this, but I'm talking about the banking system as a whole. And the banking system as a whole is taking as much risk as they want. They, f they go and they find hedge funds or private speculators who are willing to take some of this risk from them, and that involves the futures market. Okay, um, so let's put speculator here. And say they might take a long futures position in order to help the bank square up their book, um, taking a short futures position here. Okay. Now I'm going to explain now the difference between forwards and, s and futures, but I want you to have this, this sort of sequence in mind, okay? That we have the client, in fact, in, in, the, uh, in the notes I have it horizontally, but here I'll do it vert vertically, put it right in the middle, okay? There's the client, okay, who is interested in locking in uh, a loan here um, at this interest rate, okay? The bank, okay, does that and hedges its own position with other banks, say, in the forward rate agreement, which we've talked about earlier on in this, in this, in this course, the banking system. Then there's the futures exchange where there are speculators and they're dealing in this other instrument called a futures, which we're going to talk about. And then ultimately, there's the spot money market where there's actually going to be some realized interest rate. Okay, three periods from now. Now, I, the reason I'm doing this link here, okay, is you see there's a, there's a range of different kinds of instruments, okay. What we know as a, as a stylized fact about the world, okay, is that the forward rate is not an unbiased expectation of the future's spot rate, 
Okay. What we know, if it were, that's the expectations hypothesis of the term structure. Okay. And we know that although this seems like it should be true, okay, it's not true. Okay. And, in, and one of the things that we are exploring in this course is one possible reason that it's not true is because of mismatched book here okay, in the forward market that's pushing prices around, that's pushing the forward rate away from the expected spot rate. And why? Because you've got to give dealers some incentive to take this risk onto their own balance sheet. They're not in, in it for their health. They are going to take this on, on, their, on their own balance sheet. So what we have here is a sequence of transactions, hedging transactions, okay, which makes sense only if the forward rate is greater than the expected spot rate here. Okay? And each one of these takes a little piece of that difference. Okay, so you would expect, from if this theory is right, okay, if this way of thinking about the world is right, you would expect to see a difference, for example, between the forward rate of interest and the futures rate of interest, as well as the difference between the futures rate and the expected spot. Okay, so as well as forward and, and, expected, and expected spot. We know that's there. Okay, but now I'm putting futures in the middle. So talking about futures and forwards is another way of talking about forwards versus expected spot. It's the same sort of large canvas that we're, that we're writing on here. Okay, so I'll write that. So F36 greater than futures greater than expectation of R36 is, is a kind of stylized fact about, about the world. The difference between future, forwards and futures is, is quite uh, small uh, compared to the difference between forwards and expected spot, but there, there empirically is, is one. Um, often it's attributed to other things other than liquidity, as a matter of fact, but this is typical of liquidity premia, that, that finance theory tends not to recognize the existence of liquidity premia, and so when you find an asset price difference, it's some sort of risk premium gets, gets invented, but we're gonna, I'm going to explain how it all fits in, uh, in, in just now. Now, I'm gonna, the, the difference between forwards and futures is cash flow. So this gets to our advanced clearing again. A forward agreement, okay, causes no cash flow except at, uh, at maturity, okay? Futures agreements are marked to market and they cause cash flow every day, in or out, depending on which way prices move, okay? So here's where we're starting to see what I was saying, okay, banking as advanced clearing, okay, there's tremendously huge number, amount of, the, of these exposures out there, and they cause cash to move from one person to another every day, sometimes very large amounts of cash, okay, to move. This is characteristic not only of futures, but of most derivatives contracts, okay? Most, most swap agreements, there's some kind of margin, mark-to-market aspect that causes collateral to move this way and that. Um, collateral calls cause people to go out of business, okay? This is the survival constraint, okay? And I'm introducing it here today with an instrument that I feel like you know about, because we've talked about it so much, this forward rate, okay? So that when we talk about instruments you don't know about, you'll, the next two times, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize it.